Well, those of you who may not heard yet, um, uh, my wife is not here because she's at our pastor's wives retreat uh, this weekend. And um, then this week, I'll be leaving for two weeks. I'll be gone. So the next two weeks, you're going to have some good uh, guest speakers. You're going to have Pastor John, you're going to have Darren. And I'll be in Japan for the first time. I've never visited Japan, so I'll be going this Tuesday and eat some good food and uh, practice my Japanese. I won't, I won't be preaching there, though, because uh, they'll, they'll laugh me right off the stage. But anyway, uh, but I'm just letting you know, so you'll be in good hands. And of course, uh, as always, I will be praying for all of you. Even in Japan, even on vacation, there's no vacation to me to pray for the people. Okay, So even if I'm on, quote, vacation, Okay, I might be vacation from preaching or teaching or things like that, but I'm not on vacation to praying for you. So I'll be praying for each one of you every day, and as I know many of you will be praying for me, uh, thank you very much. But uh, I'm sure you'll be in good hands because the Lord's going to be with you. I'll be praying for all of you. So um, thank you for that. If you have a Bible, I'll be looking back into the book of Revelation, chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6 this morning. If you need a Bible, always there's many on the back that you can take home, that you may borrow. We'll be looking at Revelation chapter 6 this morning. Let's ask the Lord to bless this time as we look into his word. Father, we pray that you would open our hearts to you, that you would clear any distractions on my mind and our minds that are other than you, things that are on our hearts and minds this moment that distract us, that are pulling us away from hearing your voice through your spirit and also preventing us from maybe worshiping you fully as you are meant to be worshipped. Watch over us today, anoint my lips that the words that come will be your words to us for your glory. We thank you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I said, I'll be keep praying for you. Thank you for praying for me. And I thank you so for supporting us and for praying for uh, me as always. And that's always something that's never to be underestimated because that is exactly uh, why we are able to do anything uh, of any value to the Lord. It's because we pray for one another. And the Lord is with us because in answer to our prayers. Now, uh, last time that we looked uh, at the book of Revelation, I did an overview of 11 chapters. And that was quite a bit. Uh, chapters 6 through 16, I talked about just what exactly what we'll be looking forward to seeing in the book of Revelation. And so last time we looked in uh, Revelation chapter 5, we learned in chapter 5, we finished, that Jesus is in control of all the past, of all what's in the present, and of it's all that's in the future. And therefore, we see that all of history is in Jesus' hands. When the time that he took the scroll from the God the Father who was sitting on the throne as John had saw the vision as he was in, went up into heaven, he saw Jesus take the scroll, a seven-sealed scroll from God the Father's hand. And that scroll was the, all of history would unfold as he opens one by one the seals of that scroll, the beginning of the fulfillment of all of God's promises and the end and the destiny of all of history. And so all of history, by him having that scroll in his hands, is, is in Jesus' hands. The past, the present, the future. And that's what we remember, that Jesus has control of all history. It's all in his hands now. Now today in Revelation 6, what we're going to see is how God will bring justice to all who have either despised him or, or who have done evil in spite of God's will. Those who have done evil, those who have despised him, God will bring justice. And sometimes that's hard to see at this time because we see so much injustice in the world today. We see evil in the world today. We see that, well, if that's just the way it is, then, then, then where's God in all this? Well, God's fully aware. Trust me, he's fully aware of all the things that are happening on earth. But he is patient with us, not wanting anyone to repent. And at the right time, he will eventually bring justice here on earth. And so after Jesus spoke to the seven churches in Asia in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, then John was called into heaven's throne room in chapter 4. Uh, the, there he saw the angelic beings worshiping God around his throne. 
And then he saw the Lamb of God in chapter 5, taking the scroll from God the Father's hand, taking control thereby all of history and fulfilling all of God's promises. And so all creatures in the universe worship God the Father on the throne and Jesus the Son. They all worship Him equally because they're both God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all God. They're all one God in three persons. And so they were worshiping, all creatures in the universe we saw in chapter 5, were worshiping the Father and the Son. And now Jesus begins to open the seven seals in the scroll that he was given. And so what happens in the next 11 chapters is very much tied closely to what is going on in heaven's throne. That we must always tie into what we are seeing on earth to heaven's throne. It very much flows from his throne. As each of the first four seals, for example, uh, is open, one of the four living creatures that are surrounding God's throne, the ones we saw in chapter 4, verse 6 of Revelation, chapter 7, uh, 4, verse 6, we learned that, and before the throne there was a, uh, it was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal, and around the throne on each side are four living creatures full of eyes, in front and behind, the first living creature was like a lion. The second li living creature was like an ox. The third living creature with the face of a man. And the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. Those four living creatures now, who are around God's throne, one by one will open each of the first four seals on the scroll, as we will see in chapter 6. So those, those, those angelic beings, those four living creatures, are now part and parcel going to be part of God's plan to uh, begin the end of history, uh, beginning with the four uh, uh, seals that there will be open. And so as each of the uh, living creatures um, around God's throne open one of the seals, you'll see that they call for uh, four horsemen. Okay, each one of the first four seals, a horseman will come out. And the living creatures will worship God and then carry out justice, beginning with those four horsemen. Now, before I begin into the details of what we look in the chapter 6, you're going to see some stuff that maybe you're not aware of. Some people, when I, when I talk to them, I'm preaching on Revelation, they say, oh, I've kind of been a little afraid of that book. And usually when they mean they're afraid of that book, it's because, not because of the first five chapters. Because we, what we preach through, I, I mean, there are some things, especially on the persecution of the church, that could be, I guess, fearful for some people. But it's usually about the stuff that's going to happen next. The people are a little ambivalent to study or to understand what is going on, because how we think about what happens next, in the next beginning with chapter 6, actually depends on our relationship with God. How you think about what's going to happen next in the book of Revelation really much is dependent on what kind of relationship that you have with God right now. Because if you are truly grateful, for example, for God's forgiveness of your sins, if you are truly grateful that, you know, I realize that Jesus died for my sins, and I know that without Him, I'm lost. I'm separated from Him forever. That's death. I don't want to be there. I don't want to be separated from God and I am so grateful for Jesus for dying for my sins and for giving me my sins. If you truly, true, uh, really feel truly grateful for his forgiveness, then you will begin to desire the things that God desires. And when you desire the things that God desires, you'll want justice to happen on earth because you'll see there are so much things that are counter to what God's will is against his will. People despise him and they do wickedness and evil on this earth, including myself. I have still sin in my life and in your lives, I'm sure. We're, we're still not quite there yet. We're not consummated with God in heaven. Nothing is perfect here on earth. In fact, this world is very imperfect. You will strive, you will long for, if you truly love Jesus, if you're truly grateful for his forgiveness, you will long for the goodness of God. You will long for his justice. And so if you are truly grateful for your sins being forgiven, you will truly desire the things that God desires. But on the other hand, if you think that Jesus being in control of history, that should mean that I get what I want, 
whenever when, and whatever I think is best. You know, sometimes we have our own ideas of what heaven should be like. Or we have our own ideas of what God should do against those people that I dislike or those people that are doing bad on earth. Man, why God should just do this. God should just send fire bolts from heaven and punish them. God should condemn, you know, the the the, the politicians that I disagree with and I should hate on them and, and, and God should do what I want. God should hate the people that I hate. God should do whatever I think is best. If that's the kind of thing that you think about God, then it's going to be a little different for you. Because we're not in control of history. Jesus is. And so if you think that being in control of history means getting what you want and whatever you think is best, then your desires are not going to be aligned with God's desires. That's what we have to get straight here. This is not us getting what we want. This is Jesus doing what he knows is best according to his perfect will. And so God tells us that the greatest commandment, as we know, is to love him with all of our heart. Right? We, just, we sang a song about that, you know, that build my life and, and, and you, know, uh, uh, you know, just to have our love for one another, right? Okay, I will build my life and, and open up my eyes for love with one another. Okay? It's, it's about love. The greatest commandment that God commands us as his people to have, to follow, is to love him, first of all, with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. And then when people despise or ignore or offend this holy God, we have to ask ourselves, does that bother us? Because people use the name of God in vain flippantly. Okay, I sometimes hear people that call themselves Christians use God's name in vain. Okay? And they just think nothing of it because the world does that. You know? And, and so it, 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 it should bother you that God is not revered on this earth because as what we saw in verse uh, chapters five, 4 and 5 they don't think that way at all of God they, in fact they fall on his face when they're in his presence and yet it doesn't seem to bother us at all that people use God's name in vain they despise him, they ignore him they offend him wherever we turn doesn't that bother us at all? the events in Revelation will be surprising to those who do not care if people hate God the, the book of Revelation, in chapter, beginning with chapter 6, will be surprising to those who do not care if people offend God on a daily basis. People who are, are going to be surprised but what we read are not, are, they don't care if God is offended or dishonored. And so if your concerns are the opposite, though, if, you are, if, if our concerns are what God is concerned about, then Revelation 6 will not surprise us as much. It should not surprise us as much because God is a God of justice and he keeps his word. You do not want evil and injustice to go on forever if you have God's heart. Okay? If you really want, want to follow God and you love God, why would you want evil to continue forever? Why would you want injustice to continue forever? You wouldn't. And so that's why it would not be as much as a surprise to you to see the things that God was going to bring on earth. And so we have to have the understanding of what our perspective is based on what is your relationship with God now? Does it bother you that people are going on doing evil and injustice and just and that continues forever? Are you, are you satisfied with that? Okay, we shouldn't be if we truly love God. When people continually reject His grace and dishonor Him, it will eventually catch up with him. Romans chapter 1, verse 21 puts it this way. For although they knew God, they did not honor him or, as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. See, that's what happens when the world does not honor him. They don't honor him. They don't give thanks to him. They become foolish in their thinking. Their hearts become darkened. They become fools. And as the Bible says, you reap what you sow. It's going to come back to you someday. Maybe on this earth it doesn't look like it's happening now. There are a lot of people doing a lot of things, you know, in, in unjust things. Okay? And it makes our, maybe makes your, your blood boil at times. But have no fear. God is in control. God will bring justice on earth when the time is, is appropriate for him. He knows what's best. You will, we, we will reap what we sow, including us. 
And so with that perspective in mind, let's look at verse 1. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals. And I heard one of the four living creatures, this is the first one, with a, saying with a voice like thunder, come. Okay. So before, if you remember, when, when they first presented the scroll that God the Father was holding on the throne back in chapter 4, and no one we found was able to open the scroll. Remember? At first when, Je when he, we saw the scroll, they said that no one is, is worthy to open that scroll. And what did John do? He wept. He wept when no one was able to open the scroll because he says, therefore, you know, evil is going to win. If no one is able to open that scroll in God's hands, then God's promises will never be fulfilled. And so he wept when he saw that. But now... And beginning with verse 1 of chapter 6, the Lamb, Jesus the Lamb, opens that first seal. He is worthy. He is worthy. How is he worthy? Chapter 5 we learned, because he was slain. He died and paid for all of our sins. He was perfect, did not deserve death, and so his death paid for our sins, so we have been cleansed. Now he is worthy to open that scroll. And that begins with verse 1. So now he opens that scroll, verse 2. So the living creatures say, with a voice like a thunder, come, and verse 2, and I looked, and behold, a white horse, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. Now at first you might say, well, a white horse sounds like a peaceful person. His rider has a bow, though. And he came out conquering and to conquer in verse 2. Now there's an interesting similarity between this rider on a white horse and also a rider that is going to be mentioned later in Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, beginning with verse 11, it says, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written, on, written that no one knows but himself. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Okay, the only one that we know who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords is Jesus Christ. Okay, and so in Revelation 19, the rider on the white horse is clearly Jesus. But this particular writer is interesting. Because we know that in Revelation 19, the king of kings is Jesus. But this first writer in the white horse in Revelation 6 may actually be someone who appears to be like Jesus. Who appears to be like Jesus. It's no accident he's on a white horse because he's trying to appear like Jesus. But he is not. It's probably someone who appears to be like Jesus, but is not. Notice he has a bow, but it doesn't say he has any arrows. Okay, that implies that he's going to conquer, yes, but without bloodshed. He's going to conquer without bloodshed. And what that means is he will conquer through intrigue, through treaties and peace agreements. And it says a crown was given to this first writer. It says he has a bow verse 2, and a crown was given to him. The crown was given to him. Okay, He didn't take the crown. He didn't earn the crown. It was given to him. It means this authority that he had was given by others. Other nations, maybe. It was given by others. And so this appears to be a leader who gains power through a false peace without arrows and conquers meaning he gains power without bloodshed, okay? And so the kind, he's kind of like a false messiah. He's kind of like this false messiah. Matthew chapter 24 talks about this. And when Jesus himself talked about the future, he actually mentioned things about false messiahs. Matthew 24 verse 4 says, And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, many will come in my name, okay, saying, I am the Christ. 
and they will lead many astray. Okay, so people are going to come out of the woodwork saying, I am the Christ. The Christ literally means the anointed one. In, G in Hebrew, the Messiah. And so that's one and the same. So many people are going to come out and say that they're the Messiah. They're going to look like the Messiah. They're going to act like the Messiah. This one's riding on a white horse. And so people are going to deceive people, or they're going to try to at least, by mimicking Jesus. Okay, that's what this is about. See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. See, and they will lead many astray. Because people are going to fall for it. Some people will fall for it, unfortunately. But we're not. Because we know ahead of time. That's why Jesus tells us. That's why you need to study your Bible. We know beforehand that people are going to mimic that. Okay, and we'll know them by their fruits. We're going to know. Okay, don't be afraid. If you're a believer in Christ, you should know. We will be able to tell. Now, the question is, then why would God allow this? The first horseman came out. Why would God allow an imposter, a parent imposter, to be unleashed on earth? Well, like the other horsemen to follow, the three horsemen to follow, this is all part of God's judgment of wickedness on earth. Okay, this is not uh, meant to be a good thing. This, this is meant to be a, a judgmental thing. God is bringing judgment beginning with this first horseman. It is part of God's judgment of wickedness on the earth. That's why he unleashes this first horseman. A deceiver, apparently. Someone on a white horse. Just like Jesus is on a white horse in, in Revelation 19. Someone who, who conquers without bloodshed. So people think, well, he's a peaceful person. He's not killing literally anyone. Well, yes, he's just as dangerous. He's doing it through intrigue, through peace agreements, through treaties, and gaining power that other people give him. That's the first horse of the book of the first seal. Now let's look on verse 3. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. And out of out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth, so that people should slay one another. And he was given a great sword. Okay, so following this imposture in, in verse 1 and 2, following this false Messiah who brokers peace, comes after that comes this rider on a red horse who, quote, takes peace from earth. He takes peace from earth. He means he instigates war. He takes peace from earth. He causes chaos. And it says, quote, he was given a great sword, it says. See that? He was given a great sword, Verse 4, meaning he was given this authority, quote, so people should slay one another. So he didn't have to do the slaying. He just causes enough chaos so that people will slay one another. And so there'll be a lot of death and killing. He takes away peace on earth. And so after a soul called peace by this false Messiah in 1 and 2, war breaks out. Just as Jesus said it would. War is going to break out. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 6, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. So, after this rider on a white horse comes out, mimicking Christ, people are going to come out and say, I am the Christ, they will lead many astray. Then you will hear of wars Rumors of wars, see that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. And so he has given us authority so that people should slay one another, because after the so called peace from the false Messiah, war breaks out, just as Jesus said it would. Now, when you see wars going on today, there's wars going on right now. Okay. And sometimes maybe you're aware of it, sometimes you're, it's kind of in the back of your mind. But there's a war going right now for months now in Ukraine, right? We know that Russia invaded Ukraine. There's still a war going on. I talked to people who are in my neighborhood who are from that area. And they just devastated. They hate Putin because he's taking and killing people and, the, and, the, and what the military is doing to the people and, and, and destroying their infrastructure and pillaging the people and you know, raping the, the, the people that they capture. It's just terrible. 
Okay? And maybe it's in the back of our minds now because it's been going on for months. We've kind of almost been desensitized to it. And then there's, of course, the war by Hamas in Israel. There's a war there, too. Okay? People are being attacked. They're attacking back. They're retaliating. There's protests all over. Okay? That's just the beginning. Okay? That doesn't mean the end's coming. That's what Jesus said that's going to happen. It's going to happen even more. Don't be surprised when it happens more and more and more. Maybe it's going to happen in North Korea. Maybe it's going to happen in Africa. It's going to keep happening. And there are going to be these wars. And so when you see, my question is, is so when you see these wars going on, and it's going to increase, okay, it's going to increase, does that unsettle you? Well, in some ways, in a human sense, of course it unsettles us. We don't want to see suffering on this earth. But Jesus told us not to be alarmed because the end is not yet. Because you're going to think that, well, with all these things and all these people in wars going on, what's happening to the world? Are we going to get World War III? Maybe. But the end is not yet. That's what he says. Do not be alarmed. Be calm. Stay sober-minded. The alone end is not yet. This is going to happen. Okay? And again, you might think, well, well, you know, that's why this book is scary because all these things. But this is the way the world's going to end, regardless, because there's sin on this earth, and so that's what he's saying. That you're going to you're going to see wars. It's going to happen in Ukraine, in Israel. It's going to happen in other places, and it's going to increase. And he's going to take peace from the earth, so that people just slay one another. That's from a, a part of God's judgment upon evil on the earth. If you look in your outline, the first point is this. For those who do not want evil and injustice to go on forever, read that carefully. For those who do not want evil and injustice to go on forever. Do you want evil to go on forever? Who wants evil to be go on forever? Nobody. For those who do not want evil and injustice to go on forever, the events to come will not alarm us. We seek peace only from Jesus Christ. Not from some false rider on a false white horse mimicking world peace through treaties and intrigue. We are seeking peace from the only one that can give us peace, and that is Jesus Christ. Amen? Jesus Christ is the only one that we are to turn to in all these events. Jesus Christ is the only one that can broker peace. You can legislate peace. You can make peace agreements. You can stop wars from happening. But that's not true peace. The only peace that can happen is the one that can change our hearts. That can cleanse us from our sins. And only Jesus can do that. Okay? Peace on earth does not mean heaven is here. Absolutely not. As you see, after the peace on earth, then there's going to be wars. Because it's a false peace through a false Messiah. Do not be deceived. Wars will increase. does not mean the end to come. Do not be alarmed. Told you this stuff is exciting. So when people make war with one another, true peace comes only through Jesus Christ. Remember that. When the world goes to hell in a handbasket, look to Jesus. He's the only one that can broker peace. Don't follow these false messiahs and leaders and politicians and say, well, you know, at least he brings peace. I'll follow him. No. No, that's a deceiver. Follow Christ. Jesus alone gives peace and he's the only peace that we look to. So, verse 5 now. The next seal. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come. And I looked and behold a black horse and its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and wine. What's going on here? He's holding scales. And uh, I have a picture. That's a Roman era scale. Okay, Scales are used to measure things. In this case, to measure food. So why is this horseman holding scales? He's not holding a weapon. The first horseman held a bow with no arrows. The second horseman held a sword. But the third one's holding scales. How is that bringing judgment on earth? Well, he tells you what's going to happen is the scales measure food. It says wheat and barley, staples throughout the world, are going to be incredibly expensive because there's going to be a food shortage. It says, of wheat and barley will be a denarius. A quart of wheat for a, a denarius 
and three quarts of barley, which is actually supposed to be cheaper for a denarius. And you say, what's a denarius? A denarius is basically a day's wage. If you work all day, okay, a, a most common worker back in the day that th uh, this book was written, that was about a denarius, a whole day's wage. Well, when a quart of wheat was costing a denarius, that's eight to ten times the normal cost. So that's in incredible. That's like an 800% 8, inflation. 800 to 1,000% inflation. Can you imagine that? We think we have inflation right now, which we do. We think it's bad now. Think of eight times inflation. Okay, what cost, you know, what cost a dollar now costs eight dollars. What once cost a hundred dollars now costs eight hundred dollars. It's eight hundred, about eight to ten times inflation of the normal price. And so when the second writer had brought war back in verse three and four, those invading armies hurt food production. Most likely when those invading armies were they're killing one, one another, one of the side effects of war all over the world is that they steal food or they destroy crops so that the enemies could not feed themselves. And so that's going to be a side effect of what the wars are happening, the, the taking away from peace from earth in chapters verse 3 and 4, there's going to be a shortage of food and things are going to cost about 8 to 10 times more than they were. So you think you got pain now from inflation, wait till then. It's going to be extreme. And then it says something at the end, interesting, it says, but do not harm the oil and wine. Okay? And so during a food shortage, only these staples, oil and wine were also staples, only these staples were not affected. Okay? And some people say, well, because the rich people, they drink the oil and the wine, and the poor people who eat the barley and the wheat, they're going to suffer more. Maybe. Maybe that's a reason. We're not sure exactly why the oil and wine itself is not harmed, but we know that without oil and wine, they are even more suffering. Okay, so there is suffering in the terms of the wheat and barley production, but apparently not for the oil and wine. Okay, and so we all know what inflation is, okay, right? If you've lived the last four years, uh, we know what inflation is. You ever gone to the grocery store and you're like shocked, right? You're just like, what? How much meat is? How much, you know, milk? Just daily staples. Inflation's here. You go to the you go to a, a fast food restaurant now, right? What used to be called a $6 burger, right? Well, that's cheap now. I remember the, the, just four years ago, a $6 burger, that was like a huge thing. Now, even just a, like a little, tiny little thing is six, more than six bucks. I get these free Chick-fil-A sandwiches, you know, whenever the angels or the uh, when you get that free, I think on Chick-fil-A. And if I didn't, if I had to pay for that Chick-fil-A sandwich, that's six fifty, Okay, with nothing on it, just, just from the, a chicken sandwich. six fifty. And I'm like, wow, what inflation's you know out of control, we think. And we know how much we are amazed sometimes or shocked of how much food costs these days. Imagine prices being eight to ten times higher. Imagine that six dollar burger being forty-eight dollars. That's how much that's how much inflation was when, when a quart of wheat became a denarius, a day's wage, and three quarts of barley, that's like saying that little six dollar burger is now 48 bucks. That's how extreme and scarce food will be in a time. You're gonna be like, what is going on? Jesus said this is gonna happen. The scales imply there's gonna be judgment on not only the wars, and not only the false rider, but on the food shortages. And Jesus actually told us again that this would happen. He told us of such things in Matthew chapter 24, verse 7. He says, For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be, what? Famines and earthquakes in various places. Jesus told us this was happening. There's going to be a shortage of food. There's going to be famines. And when the famines come, food prices are going to go through the roof. Okay? And the earthquakes in various places. So these things will happen. Verse 7. And when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and its rider's name was Death. And Hades followed him. And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth. 
So the consequences of war would be more food shortages. And with what was the food shortages, the famine, the wars, death, disease, the loss of water and power utilities, you know, get affected like in Ukraine when there's war and they conquer places, the utilities get turned off. Okay? That's another side effect. There's no water, there's no power. And that's, what's, that's another consequence of what it was to come beforehand. Now, the horse, in this kind, the first horse we said always oh, white, the second horse was red, the second, third one's black. But the fourth one's interesting, it says it's pale. And so, what does that mean? What do you mean the horse is pale, like you can see through it, like a ghost? No, what it means is he's like a corpse. Pale is actually like a yellowish green color that you would uh, see of a, of, a, of a dead body. Okay, so this horse was like a, like a zombie, basically, is what he means. This, this, this horse was, this fourth horse was like a zombie. And its rider's name was Death, and it says, and Hades followed. Hades means the grave. Okay, so Death and Hades, the grave, followed this horseman. What it means is, if his name is Death, that the loss of life would increase. How much life, loss of life there will be? Incredible amounts. He's given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and famine. famine. One quarter of the earth. You're talking about billions of people. Okay, there are about eight billion people on earth right now. Two billion will die from this famine, food shortage, war, all this. Fourth of the earth. Death is part of God's judgment on, or wickedness on earth. Even, it says, the wild beasts of the earth are going to go in on us. Okay, so you can see that in verse 8. To kill with sword and with famine and pestilence by the wild beasts of the earth. You think, how wild beasts going to get us? Well, God actually told us, he told his people that that would happen as part of their judgment. Leviticus 26, 26, verse 22, God says to the people of Israel, I will let loose the wild beasts against you, and you sh and which shall bereave you of your children, and destroy your livestock, and make you few in number, so that your roads shall be deserted. So God already used wild beasts back in Leviticus, as he said, as part of his judgment on, on his people. Well, he's going to do the same in the future. Wild beasts will also bereave you of your children, destroy your livestock, make you few in number. So that sounds just horrible. Okay? It's a horrible thing that none of us want to have to endure. God allowed even dangerous beasts to attack his people because of their hardness of heart. And so in Matthew 24, Jesus told us that there will be false Christs, there will be wars, there will be famines, there will be death. And then he tells us in Matthew 24, 12, because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. As you might imagine, when you're faced with all that going on around you, even if you happen to survive all that, because lawlessness will be increased, Matthew 24, 12, the love of many will grow cold. See, all of these things have been going on already throughout history. Throughout human history, we've seen things in the past. There have been wars, there have been famines, there have been earthquakes. Okay? There have been the lack of peace on earth. There's been World War I and World War II. All these such things have been going on throughout human history, and they will continue with greater intensity in the future. The four horsemen were God's judgment of wickedness on earth. And those who refuse to receive God's gift of salvation and worship him will end up worshiping their false gods and false messiahs and be re and because they rejected Jesus Christ. That's not what we want. Okay, we want people to come to repentance so that they become believers so they will be spared these things. God tells about the judgments to come beforehand. He has allowed his people to remain in folly and ignorance long enough. It's enough. And, we'll, and he will allow us to suffer the consequences of our own pride that destroys ourselves 
and hurts others. Now, God doesn't want anyone to die in their sins. He waits for us to turn back to him. So you see all this, you say, well, God's bringing all this judgment and death. What's the point? The point is, God doesn't want anyone to die in their sins. He waits for us to turn back to him. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness. Because some people say, well, all this stuff you say is going to happen, but it hasn't happened yet. In fact, it's been 2,000 years since Jesus rose from the dead, and it still hasn't happened. Seems like it's a long time coming. God is really slow, apparently, it seems, in fulfilling this promise that will happen. Well, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, 2 Peter 3, 9, but is patient toward you. Why? Not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That all should reach repentance. So what is God doing? He is slow in fulfilling these things to come. He's telling us these things will come, but he's telling us beforehand so that you will repent. He's telling us because he is patient toward the world. He doesn't want anyone to perish. He doesn't want to people to die. He says, I don't want anyone to perish, not wishing anyone to perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants people to come back to him and receive forgiveness of their sins. And that's what he wants. That's the point. And that's why it seems like it's a long time coming. So, well, when's this going to happen? We don't know the exact time or date, but it's going to be prepared. Repent. Repent of your sins. Be ready. Be sober-minded. And so he is telling us these things because he wants all people to know him and to know his grace. And he's the only one that can give us true peace and true justice. And he can only one that can give us true security and everlasting joy. People worship many things. Okay, whether they worship a God formally or not, they still worship something. Because we are people created for worship. And if we don't worship our creator as we were intended to, we will worship something else, whether we realize it or not. We worship success, or we worship money, or we worship our favorite athletes, or we worship sports, we worship power, we may worship status, we worship our children. You know, our children are everything in our lives. But most of all, we worship ourselves. Do we not? We all worship something. We all, a lot of times what we worship is we worship ourselves. Social media itself breeds narcissism. Okay, look at me. Look what I'm doing. Look at me. Like my, you know, my posts. Worship me. Look at me. It breeds narcissism. And we can be led astray by, uh, we can be led astray by many false messiahs as well. We think that certain politicians will bring salvation to us somehow. Certain politicians, if, we, if they just win the, this next election, oh, that's going to be great. Really? Is he Jesus? I thought Jesus is the only Messiah. Okay? But sometimes we get so caught up into politics that we think that politicians are our Savior. Or certain teachers on the internet are our Savior. Or certain speakers or, or even pastors are our Savior. None of us are Saviors. Only Jesus. Do not be deceived. Do not put hope in anything. But God's people will not be deceived by false messiahs. The devil himself will disguise himself like an angel of light, the scripture says. He will look like himself like a like this great spiritual Christian person. I, I guarantee that. They're gonna, he's going to look like an angel of light. And so will the false messiahs. But Jesus is our only messiah. And he is coming. Amen? Jesus is our only messiah. So wars... Famines, disease, false Christ, all to come. Matthew chapter 24, verse 8. Jesus says, all these, all the things he's talking about, are but the beginning of the birth pains. Doesn't mean he's coming yet. See, all these things are going to happen. All these are but the beginning of birth pains. Okay, I never gave birth. Okay, I kind of don't want to. But I heard it's painful. Okay. I heard it's painful. Our first child, my, my wife didn't get an epidural one time. She tried to. Um, uh, she got it and the only like worked half of her body, like half. So the next three, she says, forget it. She just used uh, oral um, and, 
uh, painkillers, but she didn't have an epidural to, to kind of deaden the pain. So she just went through. So you guys, she bore birth to you, and she delivered all that pain for, for you. Birth pains mean you are anticipating a joyous end, but in the before that comes, you are enduring suffering. It's painful. That's what he says. These are but the beginning of birth pains. Yes, they're painful. Yes, this is horrible, the things that we just talked about. But we are looking forward to the end of the birth pains, which is the birth. And that's what he's saying. These are but the beginning of birth pains. Matthew 24, verse 8. Birth pains are beginning. The birth pains are painful, but they do bring new life. In your outline, I, I'm sorry, I, I, put, I copied it too low, or the, the print, I printed it out too low, so the last part is a little cut off. But what it says is, as false Christ's wars, famine, disease, and disease spread on earth, these are only birth pains. I know it's hard to read them bottom there. Do not allow your love to grow cold as evil increases. Your love for God, your love for others. Don't let your love grow cold. These are going to happen. He's telling us beforehand. Okay, lawlessness will increase. The love of many will grow cold. But that doesn't mean that it should happen to you or us. Okay, we love God. We love others as Jesus does. False Christ, wars, famine, disease spread on earth. These will happen. Do not allow your love to grow cold. Now, I know there's, there's a discussion about whether or not we'll even be here during those times because as I talked about in Revelation 3.10, that we will be spared of this judgment. And some people means we will either endure that judgment, okay, or that means we will be taken up into the air before that judgment. Okay? Both people have people believers have different views on that. So, but it's still incumbent upon me to tell you what is to come, whether or not we are taken away before that. If we are removed from that, great, great. But if not, don't be surprised. Okay? If, that, if it ends up we are still here, then we knew this was going to happen. Okay? But I am aware in Revelation 3.10, it says, yeah, you will be... Uh, go back to Revelation 3.10. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from that hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to those who dwell on the earth. And some people interpret that as that we will be completely removed before that time. Yeah, that's, that's a probable result. And I hope that does happen. Okay? But if I'm wrong and that doesn't happen... We, will, we still need to learn and know what the scripture says. Okay? Because I'm not God. Okay? I don't know all things. And so I'm going to teach you what God tells us. And that's what he tells us in Revelation 6. These things will happen. Okay? And so, as false Christs and wars and famines and disease spread on earth, these are only birth pains. Do not allow your love to grow cold. Don't let your job cold cold if you end up enduring some of these things. You're saying, oh, I thought I was supposed to be taken up already. Whether it happens or not, do not allow your love to grow cold as evil increases, because it will. Don't let it shake you. Okay, it's not, I'm not going to let it shake me. Don't let it shake you. So when nations go to war, only Jesus can bring true peace. And as false Christs and war and famine, disease increase, do not let your, our, we do not let our love for God and love for others to grow cold. Don't let your love be shaken by these things. I know it's going to be hard, but that's why he's telling us beforehand. He's telling us beforehand. Be prepared. Verse 9. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar souls of those, the souls of those who had, got, had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. People who died before, for their faithfulness to God and the good news, some of them were slain. Okay, there are martyrs. I talked about it last Sunday. That there are people in this earth, uh, today in uh, North Korea, in Somalia, in Libya, to this day, in other places, that will die are dying for, the, for just because they're believers in Jesus Christ. Okay, they are put in de uh, labor camps, and some of them were never heard from again. It's still happening, happening. But God has not forgotten those people. Trust me on this. God has not forsaken those people. God has not forsaken us, but people who died for their faithfulness to Jesus and for the good news are these people in verse 9. I saw under the altar the souls of those who have been slain for the word of God, for the witness. 
than, and for the witness they had borne. What mattered most to these people was being faithful to Jesus Christ. Come with me. More, it was more important to them to be faithful to Jesus Christ than any pleasure on earth. It was more important for them to share the good news of Jesus Christ than avoiding pain. It was more important to be faithful to Jesus Christ than life itself. It's happening in North Korea, Libya, Somalia. A living a peaceful and happy life, which we all would desire, is not the end goal. Being faithful to God is. That's the end goal of all things. More than having peace on this earth or, or living a peaceful, blissful, happy life is being faithful to Jesus Christ. That's the most important thing. Knowing that God remembers these faithful who have been slain means that God sees our faithfulness. If you were to die for his sake, God knows. He sees. You will be blessed. Verse 10. They cried out, meaning these people who had been slain, they cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? How long will you it'll take? Because I told you last time, you know, in Second Peter, that God is patient, not wanting anyone to perish, but wanting all to come to repentance. That's why it seems like he's taking a long time to fulfill all these things. He's patient. He wants people to repent. And so they ask, how long, O Lord, will you, before you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Okay, they were put to death for their witness that they had borne. Verse uh, 9 says, The souls who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne, meaning they were sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. They were sharing the good news. That's the witness they, they had borne. They were put to death because of that, some of them. They loved God and their number of their neighbor enough that they wanted to share the good news and how their sins could be forgiven. It was very important for them to, not, other people do not perish, that they share the good news of Jesus Christ with them. That was, how, that was very important to them. And so they were doing good, not evil. They weren't doing anything evil. It may have been illegal in that country, like it is in countries of this world, but nevertheless, they loved people so much they wanted to share the good news so they, their sins could be forgiven. And so they lost their lives, some of them, and they will be forgiven. They were doing good, not evil, so they will be vindicated. Verse 11, Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. First, they were given white robes, and that means they were given Christ's purity. The blood of Jesus paid for their sins, and they were made pure like we all are. White robes. When would they receive their vindication? When, quote, the number of their fellow servants should be complete, it says in verse 11, who, will be, who were to be killed as they had been. What he's saying there, in other words, when the full number of those who had been martyred are martyred. Those who are destined to be martyred will are martyred. The full number of those destined for martyrdom were put to death. Okay, so the death is not, gonna, is not ending yet because there are still places on earth where, you, where people are going to die for their faith. When that full number that God knows is complete, then they will be vindicated. These martyred believers testify to the truth that the good news of Jesus Christ, knowing and obeying God, is worth giving their lives up for. That's how much they were faithful to Jesus. And I think of my faith, I think of the faith of our church. Do we have that kind of faith? Will we survive in a country like that? Will we survive with, under that kind of persecution? Okay? Only God knows. So if God calls us to stay faithful, are we ready to die for Christ as these people were? In Philippians chapter 1, verse 20, Paul says, With full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. That's faith. That's true faith. See, we live in this comfortable America, and we sit in these churches with an air-conditioned sanctuary, and, and, you know, and we don't know the first thing about persecution. We don't know what persecution is. Oh, and we think it's the government imp imposing upon our beliefs. That's not persecution. This is persecution. 
This is when people are saying, you know, to live is Christ, to die is gain. I'm willing to die for Jesus. Are we? Because that's how much faith that these people had. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. I'm glad to die for Jesus, Paul says. That Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or death. That's the kind of faith these believers had. That's the kind of faith that Paul had. And I could look at my faith and I go, man, my faith is weak compared to these people. Verse 12. When he opened the sixth seal, I opened, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth. And the full moon became like blood. And the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. Now, this is actually similar to what Jesus had told us in Matthew 24, verse 29. Immediately, Jesus says, after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Similar to what we just read in Revelation 6, verse 12 and 13. Okay? Immediately after these events, Jesus, the Son of Man, will appear. Okay, so after you see these incredible signs in heaven, okay, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, the powers of the heavens will be shaken. The next verse, Matthew 24, 30. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. The Son of Man comes on the clouds. There is his appearance. And so with the opening of the sixth seal, Jesus will come soon afterwards. Verse 14 of Revelation 6. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up. And every mountain and island was removed from its place. Now you think, what is going on? The sky vanishing like a scroll. Every mountain and island is removed from its place. So such dramatic changes indicate that the old order of things is ending. The sky vanishes. And when the, when the mountains and the um, islands are moved, some people think that means like the Earth's tectonic plates. Okay, you know that the earth, when you study in geology, we're actually on plates that are shifting. Well, the earth tectonics plates shift so violently that mountains are actually will be moved from one location to another. That's how violently the tectonic plates are going to be moved. And mountains and islands, some of them will be, will be moved. Okay, removed from its place, moved to somewhere else. Again, all of this happens to provoke repentance. All these things are going to shake people so that we repent. That's what his goal is. He wants no one to perish. He wants all to come to repentance. So he's going to shake things up literally on, on this earth. Verse 15, when the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone slave and free hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us. Hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For great, the great day of their wrath has come. And who can stand? Who can stand? And so instead of repenting, in verse 15 through 17, people instead hide themselves. Some repent. Okay, some will become believers. But many of them, instead of repenting, they will hide themselves kings, presidents, generals, the rich and powerful, as well as every slave and free, they will try to hide in caves and rocks. The reaction to God's judgment is the same, regardless of their social status, because God's judgment is the great equalizer of all humankind. No one's going to be spared. It doesn't matter how rich and powerful or how poor you are. It doesn't matter. God's judgment is the great equalizer of all humankind. 
We're all going to be treated the same. We all have to come before the God's judgment seat equally. All of us will only be looking for a place to hide themselves in rocks and caves. Verse 16, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Why are they saying fall on us? Why would you want rocks to fall on you? Because people will be so afraid of what is occurring in those days. They will feel it is better to be buried alive than to face judgment. That's why. They know that they're doomed. And instead of repenting, they just want the rocks to fall on them. Say, why don't we repent? Why don't we just repent? Turn to Jesus. Receive his forgiveness. People will be so afraid that they will just think it's better to be buried alive. Fall on us. And it says, from, uh, uh, hide us from the uh, one who is seated on the throne, verse 16, and from the wrath of the Lamb. Okay, The Lamb is Jesus. The wrath is Judgment for those who haven't received grace through Jesus Christ. Okay? Judgment is going to be on those who have not who have chosen on their own choice. He doesn't do it to you involuntarily. You choose whether or not you want to receive his grace. If you choose to reject his grace, because some people do, even though they know what Jesus did for them and died for this, and if they still choose to reject his grace, they've chosen judgment on themselves. I'm sorry, they just chose it themselves. And so that's the wrath of the Lamb. Verse 17, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? Who can stand? And the answer is no one. No one except those who have received forgiveness of their sins through Jesus' death on the cross. And so how will I stand myself? How will I myself, I think about this, how will I stand before God's judgment? How will I be able to stand before his? Is it because I'm a pastor? No. I'm not going to be able to stand for him because I'm a pastor. Is it because of my many years of service to God or your service to God? Is that why I'm getting able to stand in his presence? No. I'm not going to be able to stand because of what things you've done or things you've done or what I've given or all the good things I have done or being a pastor for 30 years. That's not going to make me stand before Jesus. No, not at all. Only the blood of Jesus Christ will enable me to stand as well as you. Only the blood of Jesus Christ is enabling us to wear the white robes and to stand in his presence. Only him is what we turn to. So don't trust in anything you've done or all the ways, well, God's not going to judge me. This is not going to happen to me because I'm, I, I, I do all these things for the church. So do I. But I'm not going to be able to stand in his presence. Only by the blood of Jesus can anyone stand before his presence. Those who remain faithful under persecution will not be forgotten well, those who refuse to repent and receive forgiveness, they're the ones that are going to perish. By choice. It's their own choice. They chose to reject his grace. And so as nations war and only God, only Jesus brings true peace. Remember that. Only Jesus. Don't, don't trust in any other person to bring peace on this earth. It's not a true peace. Only Jesus brings peace. And as false Christs and war and famine and disease increase, don't let your love grow cold. Don't let your love grow cold. Persecuted, the persecuted will not be forgotten. Refusing to receive forgiveness was what brings judgment. So let's repent. Prepare for his coming. Father, we thank you that you allowed us this, a glimpse of what is to come. It's harrowing stuff, I admit. But Father, we are prepared because you told us beforehand because we only stand by the blood of the Lamb. We are so grateful for you, Lord, that you spare us future judgments, which we deserve along with every other being on earth. But you will spare us these things because of your grace, because of the blood of Jesus. Oh, Lord, we thank you so much for dying for us. We pray that, Lord, you would help us to trust in your forgiveness and be grateful for all you have blessed us with, which we do not deserve. And in that gratitude, love you, Lord, with all of our heart. And to love others as you love them. And because we don't want anyone else to perish as well, that we share the good news. We pray for those who don't believe you yet, so that they also may receive your grace. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.